Uh, I'd also like to express thank you to uh, Dr. Gould and the uh, Draco Academy for sponsoring the Constitution Week events. Uh, Gordon Martin is a retired associate justice of the Massachusetts Trial Court. Uh, he is an adjunct professor of law at New England School of Law, uh, now called New England Law Boston. And he has been a visiting professor in law schools of Tulane, San Diego, and the University of Mississippi. He co-authored civil rights litigation, uh, cases and perspectives in 1995, and has published articles in a number of law reviews and other publications. Judge Martin is a graduate of Harvard College with honors and New York University School of Law, where he was a Tilden scholar. Judge Martin uh, doesn't like long introductions, uh, so I'll uh, refer you to the printed program that uh, we've been handing out. Um, I first met the judge when we were both teaching at the University of Mississippi more than a decade ago. He asked me to read a manuscript and some transcriptions uh, he had been working on since 1989. Uh, more than a decade later, I'm sorry, more than 20 years later, um, he has completed his book, and that's the reason he's at Marshall. He will discuss his book on voting rights in the state of Mississippi. Judge Martins. Thank you, Vernus. Now, I don't want uh, any of you to think that it's ideal that you take 20 years to write your book. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it's better to finish than not finish. And I did begin in 1989, but to Vernus, by the time, by the time we were together at uh, Ole Miss, there was only 10 more years to go. <laughs> and I found uh, that he was this great journalism professor who had actually attended the same school in Laurel, Mississippi, that our lead witness in the Lynn case had attended, Oak Park. And Bernice was nice enough to encourage me to move on with the book and to write uh, some glorious and possibly truthful words that adorn one of the pages of the book. But I want to thank Dr. Gould, uh, Dean Dennison, and um, the John Deaver <coughs> Brinko Academy and Marshall University, really, for having me. Um, you know, some of our young people, I think, once they've gone through George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, have trouble coming up with another founding father. But John Marshall was not only John Adams' Secretary of State. He represented Richmond, Virginia in the Congress, and maybe more important, he was possibly the only Federalist who could get on with both the John Adams and the Alexander Hamilton wings of the Federalist Party. In short, before becoming Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, he was an effective politician, something that today's Supreme Court has been lacking since the retirement of Sandra Day O'Connor. And Chief Justice Marshall, established the principle of judicial review. Possibly not so much by securing William Marbury's commission as Justice of the Peace in the District of Columbia as by backing away from some other decisions that could have really wrecked the relationship of this fledgling court with President Jefferson and the rest of the Republicans. And what was more necessary for the civil rights movement that I have written about to have than judicial review? Judicial review because there were problems in our trial courts throughout the South. And we'll talk a little bit more, more about that as we go on. Now the first major case that the Department of Justice brought in Mississippi was the United States versus Theron Lind in Forest County. And CBS was there in Hattiesburg, the county seat of Forest County. Let's listen to a CBS Reports program shown in September of 1962, just five months after the initial trial that I was proud to be one of the three attorneys for the United States 
in, in covering. to that later, but we want to go back. As he puts it, that fellow Wilson, and he has been voting ever since. This is David Robertson. Can, can all of you hear? He teaches science at Good. Rowan, a segregated Negro high school in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. A graduate of Alcorn A&M College, a veteran of the Korean War, he has, since last spring, been working towards his master's degree in biology at Cornell University under a fellowship provided by the National Science Foundation. When the gene was first discovered, it was believed that it was the last thing that could be learned about the transmission of all things that we inherit. But Watson and Crick later learned by a method of X-ray diffraction that the gene is made of other material known as DNA, which is also deoxyribonucleic acid. David Robertson has tried a number of times to register to vote in Mississippi. Each time, he has been told that he is not qualified because he failed to pass Mississippi's literacy test. Technically then, David Robertson, science teacher, college graduate, master's degree candidate, and a fellow of the National Science Foundation, is illiterate. Lynn C. Lind, circuit clerk and voting registrar of Forest County, Mississippi, is one of the most powerful men in America. He and the 81 other county registrars in Mississippi, as well as registrars in Louisiana and other southern states, have the power under state law to decide who can and who cannot vote. It was Theron Lynn who ruled that David Robertson was not qualified to vote. Wilson Radio had his great WFRM, Mississippi's first radio station, now in its 39th year policy broadcasting leadership. Constable Lee Daniels is proud to be a part of tonight's election returns from Radio Hattiesburg News Central. And in making possible this broadcast, Constable Lee Daniels hopes that you, the citizens of Hattiesburg in South Mississippi, will be constantly reminded of your obligation, duty, and basic right to vote. The vote in Hattiesburg and South Mississippi guarantees better government for our section of the country. CBS reports, Mississippi on the 15th Amendment is brought to you by Maxwell House Coffee. Only one thing Good to the last drop. Another fine product of General Foods. CBS reports, Mississippi on the 15th Amendment. Now, here is CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent, David Schoenberg. Good evening. This is the Constitution of the United States of America, here in the National Archives in Washington. And this is the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which says, Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. This 15th Amendment was passed by an overwhelming majority in the Senate and the House in 1869 then signed by President Grant and ratified by 31 of the 37 states and eventually by all the states. The United States Constitution provides for uh, freedom to vote and uh, this country must uh, permit every man and woman to exercise their franchise. To shoot, as we saw in the case of Mississippi, were two young people who were involved in an effort to register people. To burn churches as a reprisal with all of the provisions of the United States Constitution, uh, at least the basic provision of the Constitution guaranteeing freedom of worship. The right to vote is very basic. 
If we're going to uh, neglect that right, then uh, all of our talk about freedom is uh, hollow. And therefore, uh, we shall give every protection that we can to uh, anybody seeking to vote. I hope everybody will register in this country. And uh, I hope they will vote. And if it requires extra legislation to an extra uh, force, uh, we shall do that. This is Hattiesburg, Mississippi, county seat of Forest County. It didn't exist until 11 years after the 15th Amendment, but it is perhaps typical of the problem President Kennedy defined. Of the 7,500 Negroes of voting age in Forest County, only 12 of them were judged eligible to vote in the 1960 presidential election. If these 12 voted, they represented two-tenths of one percent of the adult Negroes in the county. Hattiesburg is the traditional Mississippi town, drenched in magnolia and sweltering summer temperatures. Passenger trains make four stops a day. Life and death are totally segregated. Schools, churches, buses, even the cemeteries and the obituary page. This is the home of Maddie Bivens, a college junior aged 22, who lives at 306 Willis Avenue. This is the county courthouse a mile away. Here, local residents registered to vote. For most Americans, registering is a routine act. But as you watch Maddie Bivens travel the mile between her home and this courthouse, you will be watching a young American citizen in the supreme test of her life. If some of the film is not first quality, it is because there are places in Mississippi where a camera is not welcome. I was born in the house where I'm living now. And I was born in the house where I'm living now. I had planned to go down to register the day before. I was thinking if I walked along the dirt road in front of my house about the dust which would be on my shoes and the scars from the rock, and that if we had enough registered voters, Negro registered voters, that is, this wouldn't be a problem at all. Because the streets would be paved rather than dirt streets. It was a very hot day. The bus that I got on that morning had no advertisements on the outside. All of these places were places where no Negroes were allowed. Only. I got in the bus, paid my fare, and walked to the back of the bus. The bus ride from the bus stop to the downtown areas was about 12 or 15 minutes long. I got off the bus, crossed the street, and went down to the courthouse. And so I started up the steps to the courthouse. I was a little afraid. The registrar, Mr. Lynn, was on his way out. I smiled, and he's a, an extra large man. And he said to me that the lady inside will take care of you. My conversation with the lady in the office was strictly businesslike. I told her my purpose for being there, and she gave me the application to fill out. Along with the application, she gave me a section of the Constitution typed on two index cards. She told me that once I began filling out the application, she could not answer any questions concerning it. Once I began filling out the form, I wasn't afraid anymore. Now, you can bet that uh, no <coughs> white person got a section of the Mississippi Constitution long enough to be on two, on two cards. And uh, you heard David Schoenbrunn talk about the 15th Amendment. Remember in that first Reconstruction, we had the three great constitutional amendments, the 13th abolishing slavery, the 14th with its Equal Protection Clause, and the 15th with the right to vote. Well, what was the problem? The North went away with the 1876 election uh, given to Rutherford B. Hayes over, <coughs> and Professor Morris left out one of the uh, 
one of the co-scholarship holders, uh, and I appreciate that it was Elihu Root that he left out, not Samuel J. Tilden, since I'm a Democrat. <laughs> but it was Tilden who lost on that, what, eight to seven committee vote, <laughs> the 1876 election, and the North went away. The North didn't care anymore. That was a part of the deal. Rutherford B. Hayes gets the presidency if he pulls troops out of the South, and he did. Now you have seen the confrontation that occurred on the steps of the courthouse and inside the courthouse in the office of Theron Lend. And what is it, David against Goliath, the 350 pounds of Theron Lind, and David Robertson, veteran of the Korean War, Science Foundation Fellowship holder at, at Cornell University, and Maddie Vivens. And think about the idea of literacy. I'm all in favor of literacy, but do you think that Maddie Bivens had to be literate to know that her side of the tracks was dusty, unpaved, and when that bus moved on into the downtown area where the white folks lived, <clears throat> that it would be paved? She knew that, and you didn't have to be literate in order to know that. So who's standing between David and Goliath? And in this instance, it was the first appointee to the United States District Court made by John F. Kennedy. And he was a racist. His name was William Harold Cox. Why would John F. Kennedy appoint a racist as his first appointee to the federal bench? Well, who appoints federal judges? Of course, in, not, in theory, it's the President of the United States. In practice, it is the senior senator of the same party to which that president belongs. And the senior senator from Mississippi was also the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, James O. Eastland. And Judge Cox was a buddy of his, growing up in the same county in the Delta, Sunflower County, and his major, a major contributor when Senator Eastland first ran for the United States Senate. It said actually, that when the senator did first run, Judge Cox came to him, opened up his wallet, and said, this is what I need to live on. The rest is yours. Well, that's a good way to get friends among people running for political office. Now, Robert Kennedy um, was concerned still about Judge Cox. He knew that Senator Eastland was taking the position that unless Cox got to be a district court judge in the Southern District of Mississippi, there would be no Kennedy nominee get out of the Judiciary Committee. And there had been really, in terms of judicial appointments, a winner-take-all race in 1960 between then-Senator John F. Kennedy and Vice President Richard Nixon. They just, the parties had agreed that in the last year of the Eisenhower administration, no appointment would be confirmed, and the winner would get to make all of them. Now, one of the people I'm going to talk about as a worthy successor to John Marshall is Albert Tuttle. And he understood exactly what happened when Robert Kennedy brought Judge Cox up to that big office that is occupied on Constitution Avenue by the Attorney General of the United States. Tuttle said, they were talking different languages. When Bobby asked if Cox would uphold the law of the land, he was thinking about Brown versus the Board of Education. When Cox said yes, he was thinking about lynching. When Cox said he believed Negroes should have the vote, he meant two Negroes. So here's Judge Cox. And Judge Cox was going to be the <coughs> judge that we would try the Lynn case in front of. Now, I was a young lawyer just out of law school, and I was going to have the opportunity to deal with the greatest social wrong that existed in our country, which was the denial of the vote to African Americans in the Deep South. People my age were excited by the Kennedy election in 1960. We saw an end to what we perceived, quite possibly erroneously, 
as the passivity of the Eisenhower administration. I'm much more of a fan of passivity than I was when I was quite young. Um, but in Hattiesburg, as you saw, only 12 out of 7,500 Negroes, African Americans of adult age, were permitted to vote. And as I went about Mississippi in 1962 and 1963, and I worked 44 of the 82 counties in the state of Mississippi, and think about the size that we were dealing with. And there were a dozen of us lawyers, a total of a dozen to deal with the 82 counties in Mississippi, the 128 in Georgia, the parishes of Louisiana, the counties of Alabama. You think of the bureaucracies in our state, local and federal governments, and, and uh, we weren't exactly a, a bureaucracy with 12. But I saw some schools in those years that were new, that were segregated schools for blacks. When do you suppose they were built? Why, they were built after the Brown decision said that it was illegal and unconstitutional to maintain separate but equal. I think, uh, Ryan, that uh, we'll show part two from the CBS Reports uh, video. A different witness, the Reverend Wayne Kelly Pittman. And you'll see a little different in the difference in the election statistics, too. The Reverend Wayne K. Pittman is pastor of the East Pine Circuit AME Church. Since 1954, he has tried repeatedly to register to vote in Hattiesburg, where he has lived all his life. Why do you want to vote? Well, I believe that voting is a prerequisite to first-class citizenship. And then it has a lot to do with the consciousness of a person being an American in its entirety. And then I believe that if I become a qualified voter along with other Negroes here in Mississippi, that uh, we will be able to speak and get certain things that we feel that we are entitled to. But a voteless person is a hopeless person. We have nothing to do with their hearing office. We have nothing to do with their tenure of office. They feel and know that they're not obligated to us. And then again, it makes you feel that what the civil government represents for all of its people will include you too. But if we are taught one thing in our classroom and then experience different things in our streets, we wonder who is right and who is wrong. It's confusing. I've heard it said in the deep south, that if Negroes are permitted to vote, they will take over the government. What do you answer when people say things like that? I don't believe the Negroes are strong, and I definitely know that our government is not that weak. After five literacy tests, all graded unsatisfactory, Reverend Pittman finally made it this summer. This came after Registrar Lind had been ordered by a federal court judge to review a handful of Negro applicants who had testified in the Justice Department's shoot. Reverend Pittman thus became one of fewer than 30 qualified Negro voters in all of Forest County. So let's think about those numbers. And remember in the first segment that I showed you, it was 12 out of 7,500. Hey, five months went by. We had a court order, and we got up to 18 more, 30 out of 7,500. Something was wrong. Something was wrong that was going to have to change the way in which we were doing our fight for the right to vote for African Americans. We were going to, we were going to have to do something radical, and what was radical was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You know, you shouldn't have to have a master's degree in order to be able to vote in our society. Um, David Roberson had his degree from Cornell. Addie Berger from New York University. Eloise Hobson from Columbia. And uh, Jesse Stiegel, the per our lead witness who went to the same school uh, in Laurel, Mississippi that Professor Morris had attended a different time period. Chuck Lewis two master's degrees, West Virginia, the, I know that's a rival institution, but nonetheless, 
that and Oregon State. Um, and the norm for African Americans was an eighth grade education because that was all that was available to them. Now, we made a late decision in this trial. <clears throat> the late decision was to, was to add Afri to our African American witnesses, white witnesses. <clears throat> now, how are you gonna get white witnesses? We had interviewed the African Americans who were going to testify, but we didn't have any records. Judge Cox wouldn't let us look at the records of Forest County. So my section chief, Bob Owen, and I went to the Hattiesburg Public Library. We went to the yearbook section for the white high school, Hattiesburg High School. Judge Cox had limited us to a three-year period, the period that Theron Lind had been the circuit clerk. So what we had to do was figure out which of these high school graduates would have attempted to register to vote during that three-year period. Once we compiled a list of about 300, we brought in the FBI. At that point, there was no FBI office in the state of Mississippi. That occurred only after the, the killing of Andrew Goodman, of Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney uh, two years later. But the New Orleans office came in, and you know, whatever one thought of J. Edgar Hoover, agents in the field did what you asked them to do. And we had simply to lay out very detailed questions that we wanted to ask them, to have the agents ask them of, of these 300 potential witnesses. And out of that, we came up with uh, 16. Now, we weren't looking for racial converts. We just wanted people who would tell the truth, that they had either just walked in and signed <coughs> the book which was what was the case in the first two of Theron Lynn's three years, or else in that last year been given an easy section of the Constitution, not something like 16th section lands or judicial recusal, not something that went on to two pages like Maddie Bivens received, but something like there shall be no imprisonment for debt. We presented our 16 witnesses and um, it turned out that we, were, that we were shocking the attorneys, the defense attorneys for Theron Lind and for the anti-civil rights division, I'll call it, of the state of Mississippi Attorney General's office. Hey, they told Judge Cox. We thought that the government was alleging discrimination against blacks. Now we find that they're also saying that we favored white people. I didn't think that was such a radical change, but they did. And uh, I think, <coughs> I think uh, that I'm going to show you some pictures now of our witnesses and of the great judges that were appointed by Dwight Eisenhower that changed the face of appellate review, of judicial review in the southern part of the country. We're talking about a Fifth Circuit, which is not what it was today, with a division between uh, the so extreme southeast and the south central, but all of the south was a part of the Fifth Circuit that we're going to talk about. And we're going to begin with B.F. Bourne. And B.F. Bourne was the co-chair of the third little committee that the NAACP had in Forest County. He had a supermarket on Mobile Street in the heart of the black community. He was the person who posted bond when the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg was attempted to be integrated by Clyde Kennard and he was arrested on double charges. Right at the bottom is the Reverend Sam Hall. Worked for 41 years in the Hercules Powder Company. And I went to the corporate headquarters in Wilmington, Delaware, and the general counsel there was co very cooperative, gave me the records for all of our black witnesses who worked for Hercules. And Professor Morris, you will remember Jesse Stiegel. And two pictures of him. And the upper one is taken at the time when he testified 
1962 against Theron Lynn. And when I came back to interview him, he was principal of the Dawson Elementary School. And uh, Dr. Gould, I think uh, you would admire, I think you would admire his t-shirt, that I love Dawson School <coughs> t-shirt because you churn out uh, materials like, like that that are even better for Marshall and for Trinko Academy. And here, two feisty leaders, and I was asked at lunch about the role of women in this case, and each of them was very important. Eloise Hobson had taught first in Florence, South Carolina. She returned to Hattiesburg when her mother was ill, and, and uh, feisty is the adjective I always apply to Ms. Hobson, because she was irreverent, irreverent in the extreme. And one of the things that Theron Lynn required, uh, he wouldn't simply tell a black person that that person was being rejected. He, he would make them come back weeks later and then tell them or have one of the people in the office tell them that they were being rejected. And she knew she was supposed to have come back. But when I went back to interview her, she said, you know, I never went back. I never went back, but I knew I should have. And you and Mr. Doerr, John Doerr was the trial attorney that I was assisting. You and Mr. Doerr never knew that I never went back. So I just said I did. I lied like a trooper. <laughs> At the bottom, Addie Berger, the principal's wife. And the wives of principals were not supposed to rock the boat. Addie Berger was not afraid of rocking Theron Lynn's boat. The Reverend Wendell Phillips Taylor and uh, son of a Methodist minister, himself a Methodist minister, his brother Paris, the first African American to be a bishop of a predominantly white Methodist congregation. And Mrs. Taylor, who uh, always will have a soft spot in my heart because she introduced me to catfish. <laughs> now you've seen David Roberson before. The only one of our 16 witnesses witnesses, and alas, the only one still surviving. Um, he was the only one to leave Mississippi. Uh, his brother had gone to Chicago to teach, and David did that too, and he lives in the Hyde Park part of Chicago, right near the University of Chicago. There are two of his students at Roberto Clemente Community Academy. T.F. Williams, uh, lived in a suburb, Palmer's Crossing, and uh, he was in his own way feisty too. When the mayor of Hattiesburg cut off Palmer's Crossing from the city water supply, he started a water company. When his people needed subsidized housing, he started the St. Francis Housing Project and was its president. And when school integration ultimately came in the 1970s to Forest County, the then federal judge appointed TF to a committee to assist in its implementation. Then at the bottom, Willie Thigpen and his wife. Willie Thigpen, a veteran of World War II. And Willie Thigpen, when I came back to see him and, and said, Mr. Thigpen, was it, was it worth it? Was it worth the risks that you took to yourself to your job, was it worth it? And he, he said, oh, was it ever. Now I go into a store, the white man comes in, I don't have to step aside. And when I get up to the counter, they don't call me boy, they call me Mr. Big Ben. Now, you saw the video taken during the contempt trial. It took a long time for the case to be decided. It actually took nine months, which is unfortunate. But you see, Theron Lynn found guilty of contempt. And that was uh, overdue. <clears throat> but he was found guilty of civil contempt. And the first registrar in the South to be so found. Marion Brown succeeded Theron Lynn. She had gone to work for him in 1962. 
when she was being sued, she was very, when he was being sued, she was quite apolitical, um, mother of three sets of twins, not a radical in any way. She never hired a black person to work in the office, but uh, she hired her daughters in the best tradition of local government. Right. And, and uh, a nice woman, a nice woman who gave T.F. Williams application forms that he could bring to Priest Creek Missionary Baptist Church, his church, to have the young members of the church fill out. And at the bottom, R.C. Jones, a mentor of David Roberson. You know, one of the interesting things about the Forest County community was it hadn't waited for the Justice Department to arrive. It hadn't waited for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to be created. They brought suit themselves in the early 1950s against the predecessor registrar, Luther Cox, not a relative of the judge. And they did not succeed. It was a different Fifth Circuit at that time to which the, the appeal was taken. But it was important. It was important that there be that background, that there have been that kind of initiative. Now there's a second picture of the Reverend Sam Hall. And people ask me why I wrote this book. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was that I wanted people, the public, to become aware of my witnesses. I wanted them to remember that the Civil Rights Movement was more than Dr. King, more than Congressman John Lewis, or Roy Wilkins, or James <coughs> Farmer. Um, and here's Sam Hall. And in Memphis, when we were doing a Southern tour, I met his grandson, Reggie Howes. And Reggie, who's in his early 30s, said, you know, I was only three when my grandfather, Reverend Hall, died. I never knew he was a hero. Well, Reggie Howes knows now that Sam Hall was a hero. And so was Richard Boyd. Right down, oh, <clears throat> wearing a, a church t-shirt from uh, his, his church. He was the first person, the first African American, to be in a, in a white man's job. How do you define that? Well, it was white people who got the skilled jobs. It was blacks who had to do the laboring jobs. And he was the person who first was put by his shop steward up Dunnigan into a skilled job. And he had tried time after time to be registered to vote. He testified in a later trial that it was 50 times that he tried. And the predecessor registrar, Luther Cox, finally said to him, why do you keep coming and bothering me? And Mr. Boyd said, you know, I go to statewide Masonic meetings. And they keep saying, why aren't you registered to vote? Well, Luther Cox scowled at him and said, you tell those blankety blanks in Jackson to mind their own business. But he did let Richard Boyd sign the book. Now, this is a picture of me initially on the top with uh, Founder John Israel. And he was assigned during this trial. <clears throat> this is pictures taken quite a bit later. But during the trial, he was assigned to Sacred Heart Parish in Hattiesburg. And I went to him. I'm a Roman Catholic. I thought I've got to try my own church and see if I get some help. And he came up with the daughter of the florist, Helen Coughlin, who became one of our 16 white witnesses. And that's me below with T.F. Williams, whom I've talked about previously. So I've talked about uh, various people, but right at the top is Felton Henderson, the first African-American to serve in the trial staff of the Civil Rights Division. And initially, when I came to the division, we were all white. Now, why would that have been? It wasn't because of a lack of interest among the few African-Americans who had become lawyers. It was because there was no place for them to stay in the South. This was still two years 
before the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And Title II, I want all of you to keep that in mind. Title II is what made open public accommodations in this country. And Felton, when he joined us, could only stay on federal air bases in the South. The one motel that Dr. King stayed at in Birmingham, uh, in Jackson, he had to stay at a, at a funeral home, a black funeral home. He has told me that he still can smell the formaldehyde. Mm -hmm. Now, the one, the one judge on the Fifth Circuit who was a leader in civil rights before the appointments that were made by <coughs> uh, Dwight Eisenhower was Richard Reeves from Montgomery, Alabama, a Truman appointee, and he was a leader also. Things changed in the Civil Rights Division when John Doerr was appointed to the <coughs> post of first assistant. Ace Tyler was the last of the, of the Eisenhower Assistant Attorneys General. Remember that uh, President Eisenhower only had that statue for his final three years in office. John was not the kind of person to sit back and wait for reports to come in from the field. But that's the way that the Department of Justice operated then. It was um, the US attorney who might send a report, the local regional US attorney. It was the FBI agents. And John wanted young lawyers who cared about the right to vote for African Americans to go out, meet our witnesses, create new witnesses, and that's what I was one of those who was fortunate enough to do. Okay. Up at the top um, are two of the patronage appointees of President Eisenhower. Now, a lot of people think that patronage is a dirty word, that uh, you want good, open competition for jobs. That's not a bad thing to have. But if a, if a patronage appointee <clears throat> is going to do the best job, then you want that person. Now, how did those two men get acquainted with President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower at that point in 1952? They fought <coughs> against your neighbor, Senator Robert Taft from Ohio, to get Eisenhower the nomination. Tuttle on the left from Atlanta, Brown on the right from Houston, and we'll see in a minute John Minor Wisdom from New Orleans. And when I went into his office for the first time in the courthouse, which is now named for him in New Orleans, there's a great picture of him riding uh, with uh, Ike and Mamie, the Eisenhowers, with his hat up in the air as the leader of the Eisenhower campaign in New Orleans. And they uh, fought, they didn't win at the local level, but they won at the Chicago Convention of the Republican Party of 1952. Look at the bottom. And there you see Vernon Damer Jr. And as I wrote in the caption, thinking of his father's sacrifice because his father was murdered by the white knights of the Klan. And the cover of the book is a demonstration <coughs> that that uh, you will see um, a demonstration on the morning of, of his father's funeral. And that sacrifice led to the election of Barack Obama because it led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act and without the Voting Rights Act, the black electorate never would have been large enough to influence the election as it did in 2008. <coughs> And there's Judge Wisdom right at the top. Socialite from New Orleans. He uh, didn't mind being ostracized by his wealthy friends in New Orleans. And there's Vernon Damer right in the middle. A fun-loving, gregarious guy. When I would visit him getting ready for the trial and after the trial, he would always want me to ride his tractor. A city boy from Boston, uh, he was very amused when I visited and Jay Golden from, from New York also. And there's the picture that's on the cover, the demonstration on the morning of Vernon's funeral. 
And up at the top, Robert Kennedy, Attorney General of the United States. On the first day that he was Attorney General, he walked into John Doerr's office. John was the acting assistant Attorney General. And he said, what are you doing to get black people the right to vote? Show me the counties that you have a case pending in. Show me the counties that you have an investigation pending in. That the Kennedy administration was slow in the civil rights area, but not in that part of it that consisted of voting rights. And with Bobby is Burke Marshall, who became the Assistant Attorney General in March. And right at the bottom, the great, how many people, and I know we have a young audience, but uh, have any of you ever before seen a Herb Locke cartoon? Okay, I see one nod at least. Um, and um, Herb Locke was the great political cartoonist syndicated by the Washington Post. And here you see that cringing Southern registrar leaning backwards on his desk as an FBI man comes in with a subpoena from the Department of Justice. And he mutters to him, you mean so? Let them mingle ballots in the same box with ours? Herb Locke autographed to me that to me in 1961. <laughs> And up at the top, Reverend Pittman, whom you've seen previously on the, on the video. A hopeless person, a hopeless person is a hopeless person. He would be shocked to know that we had a black president today. And at the bottom, the shop steward, the white shop steward, one big tough guy, Huck Dunnigan, who told his black workers, you know, I'm no integrationist. They want to keep the kids separate in schools. I couldn't care less. But my men, and at that point they were all men, my men not be able to vote, my men not be able to hold any job that they are capable of holding, I will not permit it. And he told his black workers that he would see that they did not lose their jobs by attempting to vote. And Huck Dunnigan delivered. Big, tough guy threatened by the Klan, as were his uh, children, particularly his son, the editor of the paper in Macomb, a good paper. And Huck would sit outside in a chair with his shotgun on his lap and let the word be known that uh, if there was any threat to him from the Klan or to his son, he would kill the person doing it, and he would have. And I think that's it. And Ryan, you've done a great job. And moving things forward, and thank you very much. OK. Now, I'm just going to conclude before we see if you have any questions with a quote from Chief Justice Marshall. The Judicial Department comes home and its effects to every man's fireside. It passes on his property his reputation, his life. I have always thought that the greatest scourge an angry heaven ever inflicted on an ungrateful and sinning people was an ignorant, a corrupt, or dependent judiciary. And John Marshall, I think, would have been very pleased with the four, as they were called by Ben Cameron, the Mississippi judge on the Fifth Circuit, the four who controlled as best they could the district court judges, and those four were Tuttle, Wisdom, Brown, and Reeves. And I've appreciated uh, your attendance, and if there are any questions, happy to have them. Yes. Judge, with the benefit of hindsight, it seems obvious that they were in violation of the 15th Amendment from the fashion. So with the benefit of hindsight, it seems so obvious that the case is made for you, which begs the question, why did you have to make the case if it seems so obvious now? Well, you always have to make a case, and you've got to have witnesses. You have to have witnesses. And one reason why um, Forest County was so important was that there were witnesses, and particularly those teacher witnesses that I've referred to. <clears throat> um, with all those master's degrees. And when South Carolina challenged the Voting Rights Act, uh, Chief Justice Warren, in his opinion, referred to 
our, our teacher witnesses because we had always let voting be controlled by the states. When, um, when poor old Susan B. Anthony, and remember, there was no benefit that was given to women in the 15th Amendment. Women had to wait until the 20th century before they were given the opportunity to vote. And, but when uh, she was prosecuted in Rochester, New York, <coughs> for her going in and voting for Congress, the judge in Rochester, New York, said she knew she was a woman, and she still went and attempted to vote, and uh, went on to say, if the state of New York says you can't vote until you're 30, or you can't vote after you're 50, or you can't vote if you have gray hair, or you can't vote if you're disabled, the state of New York would control. We wanted the states no longer to control. With 82 counties in Mississippi, as I've said, and the 128 in Georgia, and all those parishes in Louisiana, we needed something that would go beyond the case-by-case -case method. But in order to make the first case, you need witnesses. And we were provided those witnesses by the courageous people of Forest County. Anybody else? I guess I've answered all questions, maybe not all. Well, I, I <clears throat> did come back uh, after being in, in the division from 61 to 63. I did come back to Massachusetts as an assistant United States attorney to Judge Garrity, who was the judge who ultimately tried the Boston School case. Uh, but I came back as an assistant when he was the US attorney there. And I handled all civil rights matters in Massachusetts. Um, and they included, uh, for example, police brutality and taking on the Boston Police Department was a big deal, believe me. I remember uh, it was the alleged victim in the case was a young Puerto Rican named Miguel Torres, and I remember the, the lawyer for the police department presenting me triumphantly with a long criminal record for somebody named Miguel Torres, clearly a different person, different in age, upbringing, and so forth. But um, we, we the change, the change came really a change in the attitude towards civil rights with the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the riots that began in Watson continued in other cities, including some in Roxbury. Um, I, think, I think the sense of justice that I had as a lawyer in the Civil Rights Division helped me when I became a judge of the Roxbury District Court. Yes. Well, my tires were slashed in East Carroll Parish, Louisiana, right on the Arkansas border. And um, one family got quite annoyed with me. It turned out that in that screening process even that, uh, that I was speaking of, when after the FBI had done its um, um, interviews and had given us their reports for the 300, then we were trying to screen it down to 16 manageable white witnesses. And I went to one family that had a 25-year-old son, and the family was very annoyed. They were very annoyed because by mistake, the FBI had sent two different sets of, of um, agents to interview this young man. And then I showed up as the third federal presence in the same day, and they were very upset. Um, it took all of my Massachusetts charm to uh, <coughs> convince them that um, I knew they were 100% good Americans and, and uh, really wanted qualified blacks to vote. And, and uh, they wound up inviting me to stay for dinner and to come back and shoot a bird sometime. I politely declined both. Anybody else? Yes. I'm honored. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that um, the Drinko Academy and that the university uh, wanted me to do this. And I think it ties in perfectly. And one of the nice things about having been invited to be here um, 
is that I've learned a lot more about John Marshall than I knew previously. So I think it's great. Yes? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like in our history we still have more civil rights fight, so continued fight as today? Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, one of the <clears throat> one of the major tragedies in our country. Um, you know, we we don't remember that when somebody is imprisoned, unless that person is murdered in prison, <clears throat> um, or is serving a life sentence. Um, he or she is going to get out. And what kind of person do you want to have that individual to be when they are released? You want them to return to society. You want them to have a skill that will make them employable. And uh, we are not doing that in our correctional system. And then the final straw is felon disfranchisement, uh, which has both racial and political aspects because in general, we don't let people vote. <clears throat> and, uh, but what's more basic? That was basic for those in 1962. It's basic for those in 2011, that you have the opportunity to vote. And I think that's one of the challenges. I hope each of you, whether it's in West Virginia or wherever you ultimately settle down, will watch the legislation as it exists in your jurisdiction and do something about it. It's a great opportunity for young people who care to get involved in local politics. And get involved in local politics that can lead to your being in the legislature. That can lead to your saying that when somebody com finishes a sentence that their rights are restored. And I found, for example, in, in the Roxbury District Court, I would get an inaccurate record every month for somebody appearing before me and clearing up an inadequate record, uh, an erroneous record is hellish. It takes a probation officer full time to work on doing it. Uh, and yet, why should somebody be blamed because that person had a cousin who knew his social security number and could pass off an offense that he was committing as being the other person's offense? It, it's a very... Um, you know, it's, it sounds simple, but it's not, and we've got to deal with that. We had another question over here. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any comments to make on the present-day blocks that states are incorporating in their laws to block people's right to vote? I think the, the whole swing of ID legislation that uh, is pending in some six or seven states and, and is passed in, in others is um, an unfortunate Thing when what we want is greater participation. We don't want to put roadblocks. If there were rampant street fraud, one could understand it. But in recent decades, there has been no example that could be, could be cited of, of that kind of walk-in fraud in the polling places. And the Bush administration actually fired two United States attorneys who simply refused to go along with their desire that street fraud be a priority of the Department of Justice because it, there was no basis for it. Yes? Uh, as a lawyer and a lawyer, uh, do you think that the point of time cases should ever have a word or have you had ones that were even more time? Oh, I think, that, I think this was a trying one. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed doing, you enjoy working against, uh, against um, adversaries that are tough. And I spent a decade, in part, litigating against the NCAA. When, and uh, and I, would, I would say that in the period of this talk, the NCAA has probably violated the rights of five athletic directors and 24 student athletes. And they did it a lot more back in the decade in which I was litigating against them. <clears throat> there was discrimination against foreign student athletes, uh, and I was responsible for their rules against foreign student athletes being ruled unconstitutional. And uh, that was a lot of fun taking on the NCAA. It was the first reported case they ever lost, a case called Buckton versus the NCAA 366 Federal Supplement 1152. I guess everybody wants to go home, or else almost get ready for the next class at 315. 
Well, thank you very much for having me here.